Shannon is Williamson Medical Center's EMS training officer. She has been with Williamson Medical Center EMS since 2004 and has been an instructor since 2005, teaching American Heart Association and many nationally recognized classes. So please welcome Shannon. Thank you, Thank you all very much for having us tonight. This class, like Adrian said, is not a certification class, but what we are going to share with you is how to help your child or someone else's child or a child here at church if they are choking. We're going to center on infants tonight, and we're also going to show you if your efforts to relieve what is choking them doesn't work, what to do next. Now, I have been fighting allergies, so if my voice cracks, please know that um, I'm, I'm not nervous or I'm not losing my voice, it's just coming back. So, we're gonna get started. My child is choking, what do I do? Let me tell you a little bit about Williamson Medical Center EMS to kind of put this in perspective. We have 10 EMS stations throughout the county, which means countywide we have about a six minute response time after you call 911. Now here in the city of Franklin, it's much shorter, but out in the outer lying rural areas, it's about six minutes average. So that's why it's so important that we educate people on how to relieve a choking um, victim, how to do hands-only CPR, how to do basic first aid, because there may be two, three, four, six minutes before EMS is on scene. Now, a couple of things. Many, many people are afraid to call 911. We do not want you to be, especially with infants. It's very important that you call 911 as soon as possible because with babies, they don't have the reserves we have as adults. With adults, we've got a good four minutes of oxygen in our blood. If I collapse here and stop breathing, even if none of you all saw fit to act and to try to administer CPR to me, I have four minutes of oxygen in my blood, which means <laughs> that my brain is going to stay perfused and to stay healthy for at least four minutes. But with infants, they don't have that. So it's very, very important that you call 911 and get the emergency response started. We have 100 full-time and part-time clinical personnel, which means um, that we have a whole lot of people that are trained to the highest level we can train them. I am also blessed to be one of the trainers of the responding agencies in the county, the three paid fire departments, and then the six agencies that are volunteer in the county. So we all work as a team. We're all trained to the same level and we're all trained by the same people. So you're going to get the same response regardless of where you live in the county. All right, define choking. Now we've all gotten water down um, our esophagus. We've all eaten a grape and kind of, <coughs> I'm just choked, I'll be fine. We've all heard someone say that, or we've said that. However, if you can talk, you're not actually choking. You may have a partial obstruction, which means you have something stuck in your throat or it feels like it is, but you're not choking. Choking, if you can talk, if you can cough, you're not choking. However, the American Heart Association has been telling us for years that this is the universal sign of choking. I am here to tell you, I've never seen a choking victim actually do this. So don't expect someone to give you this sign. And if someone doesn't give you this sign, but is obviously choking, please don't wait for the sign, all right? So, can you talk, can you cough? Now these two things are a little different with infants. With infants, obviously they're not going to be able to talk. And many of them, a cough reflex is a, is a very learned response. So they may not be able to cough. Babies, especially the young infants, they turn colors. They will turn um, purple, they'll turn red. They, after they have been choking for a few minutes, they will start to turn gray and blue. My son, who is now seven and a half and very, very healthy, choked and he turned magenta red right off the bat. So there is, there's no rhyme or reason to what color they're going to turn, but know that if a baby turns colors and stops making noise, all of you all have heard babies. Um, in some setting. They cry, they grunt, they, they make little cute sounds. 
A baby will not make any noise if it's truly choking. They may be moving, they may be thrashing, but they're not making any noise. You can't hear them breathe. Have you ever sat beside someone even <coughs> when it's not allergy season in Tennessee, you can still hear them breathe, you can hear a baby breathe when they're asleep. You won't be able to hear any of that. So a baby is going to turn colors and be silent when they're choking. All right, what do children choke on? Everything. As a new mother, I thought, well, I can protect my child by not giving them whole grapes. I can't give them, um, I need to cut the hot dog smaller as he got older, things like that. Marbles, I'm not going to leave buttons around. Things that I thought a child would pick up. However, anything is a choking hazard. Anything that a child can get in their mouth that's small, that's small enough to go in their mouth, they can choke on it, including things like chicken soup. Okay, So this is not, most people don't think of soup as a choking hazard, but chicken noodle soup is. It has noodles in it, has small pieces of chicken. So anything they can put in their mouth, including soups. So don't think just because, oh, I can leave them for a minute because all they're eating is name the food. That's never, that's never the case. So I want you all to be aware that anything is a choking hazard. Okay, this is a bad picture and this is not an a and class and I'm not going to subject you to my anatomy lesson because it's painful. But this is a gummy bear. A gummy bear, this is where, this is where you're normally going to choke. All right, we always think it's right in the back of the throat. Usually it's going to be a little farther down. And a gummy, this is a pediatric or a child's airway. So you can see a gummy bear, which we think is tiny, fills up their whole trachea. A child's trachea is going to be the size of their pinky. So anything that is bigger than that can become lodged. All right. Is that rain? Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. <laughs> All right. If someone is choking, the most important thing that you can do is not to panic. If you panic, you're going to forget anything that you've trained on, anything that you've learned, any kind of muscle memory. If you panic, the child is automatically going to panic, especially if you're with mom, dad, grandparents, caregiver. They look to you as their rock. If you're panicking, that they're going to panic. So please don't panic. Um, I have friends that if something goes wrong, they immediately scream, throw up their hands and run in circles. Let's not do that, all right? That doesn't do anything. First and foremost, if you have a child that is choking, if you're in a group, if we had a baby here in a group and the baby started choking, please designate someone to call 911. A lot of these obstructions, choking obstructions, are easily removed or are removed after several attempts. They still need to be seen at the ER, whether that is EMS comes out and checks them out or EMS transports them. Because a baby's trachea, like I showed you, is so small, if something lodges in it, it can tear it, it can bruise it, it can damage it. And when we, and when we practice how we dislodge something that's in a child's throat, it can be very um, aggressive. I don't want to say violent, but it can be very aggressive. And these little guys are small. They need to be checked out. So this is always a medical emergency. So if you're in a group, call 911. Have someone call 911. As humans, if, if, if we're in a group and we're not designated to do something, we'll all stand around and assume someone else does it. That's just the way we're made. So, if you see something like this happening, always designate somebody to go. Please call 911. That way we know somebody's doing it. All right, there is a baby that is choking. We're going to remove the obstruction. Now, has anyone in here been certified in CPR before? Okay. All right. I'm not sure how long ago you took CPR, but they have made many changes, and we're not going to get into that. They'll get into that in, if, if you take a certification class. However, they used to say, if someone's choking, do a blind finger sweep. Take your fingers in the person's mouth and swipe and see if you can get anything out. Well, we have learned better not to do that. 
for a couple reasons. I don't want to put my fingers in someone's mouth because usually you will get bitten. The other reason you don't want to do that, while these are plastic, they're ugly alien babies, and I understand that. But that little bitty mouth, that's, no much, that's not much bigger than an actual infant's mouth. Our big fingers, even if there's something in their mouth, if there's something in the back of their throat, if we stick our fingers in because of the small area of their mouth, chances are we're going to shove it farther back. So please don't do that. The only time you need to take the obstruction out is if it's right at the corner of their mouth where you can take it, all right? Okay, let's talk about children before we talk about infants because children are a little easier than, than our little alien babies here. Everybody has heard of abdominal thrust, the Heimlich maneuver. Everybody's heard of that. If you have a child that is choking, now by child I mean um, a toddler and up, okay, a toddler up to a teenager. You're going to treat them just like you would treat an adult. To do that, if it's a child, you would kneel behind them or you would put them up on a table or chair to get them up to your level. Now, I prefer kneeling because if you put someone on a table or chair, the next thing that's going to happen is they're going to fall off. That's just, Murphy is my friend and that's how it always happens, all right? So kneel behind them. Find their belly button, and you can find it on yourself. I would prefer you didn't find it on your neighbor, but find it on yourself, and take your fist. Find your, find your belly button, take your fist, and make a, make a fist like this with your thumb on the outside. And, it, and if you are expecting, I don't expect you to do this, all right? The rest of you, make a fist, find your belly button, the top of your belly button, lay the fist on top of the belly button, and roll up where the flat part of your hand is against your, your abdomen, all right? So feel that placement. Now, if you pull in and up quickly, you will probably feel a little rush of air. Don't do it hard if you've eaten or had mm -hmm. anything to drink um, recently, but if you do that on yourself, you feel a little rush of air. In order to relieve a choking um, victim's obstruction, you need to pull hard, fast, and upward, as hard as you can. Now on a child, we usually say, I don't want to hurt them. Um, I outweigh them, I'm bigger, I don't want to hurt them. Understand that when a child is choking, they have a very limited amount of time before they become unresponsive. In order to relieve this obstruction, we want to pull hard and fast and upward, and we want this obstruction out. I would much rather than have a sore belly than the alternative, all right? So, pull up, and you continue to do that until the obstruction comes out, or they become unresponsive, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, an infant, and y'all can grab your infants. They won't bite, they just look like it. An infant's a little different. An infant usually can't stand, and even if they're if they're a 13 month old that is standing and um, they have walked early, that's earlier than my son walked, and that's late for some children to understand, but 13 month old, they're just kind of standing. You can't stand them up. You can't do the what used to be called the Heimlich on them. What you need to do with, a, with an infant, they have those big bobble heads, okay? So we always want to support the head. You need to be sitting or leaning Standing is very hard. You can do it standing, but I'm glad you all are sitting down. The first thing you want to do is support them on your forearm, face down. Be sure and hold their head. If their head falls off, <laughs> your work here is done. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> Swap with me. Okay. Real baby's heads don't fall off, just FYI. Okay, so you're supporting that infant. Since you're sitting down, rest your forearm on your knee. You want gravity to be your friend, all right? You want that head face down. And you're gonna take the back of your hand, and in the middle of the back, you're going to do five back blows. One, two, three, four, five. Now, like I said a minute ago, People think they're going to hurt this child, and I get that. None of us would ever hit a child like this unless they're choking, but this needs to be hard, and it needs to be with enough force 
to knock what is ever in that airway out. We've got their head down, so gravity, if it's close, is going to fall out. Now, you're going to do that five times. If something doesn't fly out, or they start crying, or you know the obstruction is still in there, they're not turning back to a normal pink color, they're still red or blue, you're going to flip them over on your other arm, supporting them on your forearm. Be sure and support that head. Okay, be sure and support that head. Keep them down. And then you're gonna take two, your two middle fingers, ring or metal, metal or pointer, doesn't matter whichever one are stronger, and you're going to place them in the middle of the chest. And you're going to do five chest compressions. So you're just one, two, three, four, five. Now, you're going to do about two inches down. That seems like a lot, and that seems very hard, especially on these little foam babies. But two inches, you're going to compress their chest. Now, if that doesn't work, we're going to continue this cycle of five and five and five and five until one of two things happens. Until the obstruction comes out, they're crying. Now they're a crying baby. While I never believed it when I had a crying baby, a crying baby is a wonderful, wonderful sound. <laughs> that means they're breathing. So you, if this child that you just did back blows and chest compressions or just back blows, if they are crying, then you did a great job. All right, crying is good. If the obstruction has not come out, if they have not gone from purple back to a, a nice pink baby, if they're not crying, if they're not breathing, um, then you will continue that cycle. They will either start crying and get better or they will become unresponsive. Now, no one wants to talk about the next part. However, it's very, very important that we do. If a child or an infant becomes unresponsive after choking, you're going straight to CPR. And I'm going to demonstrate that tonight and we're going to practice it, uh, not so you will be certified, but because you need to have some muscle memory so you can do this. You do not have to be certified in CPR to do the CPR. You do not have to take a class to attempt chest compressions on a child, on an infant, on an adult. We have been, we have been very, very fortunate in this county that um, we have a lot of people that have been trained in hands-only CPR, and because of that, our resuscitation rates for out-of-hospital cardiac arrest are um, five times the national average. And that's not, that's not um, because we're the best EMS system ever, which we are, but that's not the reason. Mm -hmm. It's because these people that are not afraid to jump in there and do chest compressions before we get there. So, let's talk about CPR. We don't want to talk about it, we don't want to think about it, but let's talk about it a little bit. A chest compression, what you're doing with a chest compression, the heart sits in the middle, of your chest. We've always learned to put your hand over your heart and it's on this side. Actually, it's right in the middle. It sits kind of crooked, but it sits right in the middle. There is a hard bone that goes down your chest called a sternum. And this is a very, very hard, flat bone. It's very hard to break. The heart sits right behind the sternum. So during a chest compression, you are depressing the sternum into the heart, which in turn pushes that heart into the spine. So you've got two hard bones, and when you depress that sternum, you're pushing the heart. During cardiac arrest, the heart either stops or it sits there and does something called fibrillation. It's just kind of wiggling like a bowl of jello. The heart to actually work has to pump. So if the heart has stopped, what we are doing with compressions is we're pumping it, we're pushing the blood out, and when we let off the chest, it refills, we're pushing the blood through. What these compressions are doing, I told you earlier that babies especially don't have the oxygen reserves in their body that we do. What we're doing, the oxygen that they have in their body, we're circulating it to keep their brain perfused so they don't lose any brain cells. So, with your infant, if your infant has gone unresponsive, after your best attempts at back blows and, and chest compressions. You are going to, if you're in a group, 
you're going to have someone call 911 immediately. You're not going to wait. If you're by yourself, you are going to do you are going to do CPR for two minutes, and then you're going to call 911. With this size, this the infants are great because they're portable. You can you can carry them to the phone with cell phones with speaker phones. You can do hands free. You can do any of that all day long. So get not get EMS in route. Get the fire department in route. Get PD in route. Whomever the responder is that is coming that's going to get there first, you need help. Even if you're highly skilled and highly trained at CPR, you need help. This gets very tiresome, even on a little one. So, if your child has become unresponsive, you're going to put them on a table, a bar, a chair. Don't lay them on the floor because, especially with this size, it's very, very hard to do an effective compression on the floor. As adults, we have to get down there and they're a little low. So put them up where we can work, all right? You're gonna take your two middle fingers, whichever two you prefer, and you're going to find the middle of their chest again. Now, you are going to compress that sternum, either two, one and a half to two inches, or a third of the width of their torso. So you need to push it at least a third of the way to the floor or to the bar or whatever. On these little dummies, these little mannequins, you're not going to be able to do it because the foam is too hard. On a, on a human being, especially an infant, it is much easier to get a compression. Know that these little guys, when they're this size, their bones have not calcified like many of us that are older. Their bones are very pliable. And so, those of you all that have been certified in CPR before, a lot of people ask me, well, what if you don't hear the cracking and the popping and the bones breaking? On um, these little guys, you will not hear this normally because everything's so pliable. They're just pushing it and it's just moving. So go ahead and get a good compression in. You are going to do a minimum of 100 compressions a minute. Now that seems like a lot, but, um, we have a whole range of, of age and experience level one here. So, um, the Bee Gees, Staying Alive. Is everyone familiar with that song? Um, Queen, Another One Bites the Dust. Rocky Top. Has everybody heard a song that they know? Okay. Sometimes I teach classes and they look at me like I'm, I'm way older than I am. So. One of those songs, those are all 100 beats a minute. You're going to do a minimum of 100 compressions a minute, up to 120 compressions a minute. The big thing with compressions, you're going to compress and be sure you let, you don't want to take your fingers off the chest, but you do want to let that chest recoil because if you don't, the heart can't fill up with blood again. So you are, you are doing 100 compressions a minute. Now, this is going to get very tiresome. Please, if someone is with you, or someone comes up to you, or um, someone, there's someone else around, if they say, let me help, I know how to do this, I know CPR, swap with them. Especially if it's a child that you know, but no, any child, you're not going to want to hand it over to someone else. I, I've got it, I'm doing it. Please do. With any kind of CPR, whether it's infant, child, adult, it gets very tiresome. Our adrenaline's going. We're scared to death. This is horrible. But we will get tired. And as we get tired, the compressions are not as effective. So swap out with someone. Now, if, if you get tired, if these two fingers get tired, uh, it doesn't matter how you're doing it. I had someone um, in a daycare not long ago ask me if she could use her phone because it was stronger. Absolutely. Do whatever you need to do to get a good compression. To me, that's a little harder, okay? But it is, it, it is what it is. Questions on how to do that. Now, if the child's a little older, if you're talking a toddler or an older child, you're going to do the exact same thing. You're going to do 100 to 120 compressions a minute but you're going to do it with the heel of your hand. Remember how you did back blows on that baby? You're going to do compressions. 
with a heel of your hand because it's stronger. You may need, depending on the size of the child, to use both hands, and that's all right. Now, one thing that may be easier, if, you're, if your fingers are weak, I don't have strong fingers, you may want to use two thumbs. That's a technique that we usually use in healthcare when there's two of us, but if you're by yourself and your fingers are tired, you do whatever you need to do. At this point, you are not harming this child. If you are doing CPR on any person, you are not doing any harm. And let me tell you why. Once you have started CPR on a person, they are not living. As, as bad as that sounds, as much as we don't want to admit that, if you are doing CPR, they are not alive. So anything you do is an improvement. There is, there is nothing that you can do as lay people that is going to be wrong when you are attempting CPR. All right. I don't want anyone to be afraid of doing this because you haven't had enough training or you haven't had the right certification classes. That's not it at all. Questions so far? Yes, sir. So we're pushing over the sternum <coughs> yes, in the sir. middle of the chest, basically. Yes, sir. So it's going to be hard. It's going to be very hard. Even on an infant where the where all this all the bones are still pliable, that sternum is one of the strongest bones on the body. It is going to push. It's not going to be it's not going to be soft and squishy um, in any kind of case like this. Do you have to be concerned about exactly where you are, or as long as you're just kind of like in this area? Yes and no. Um, on an adult it's much harder to find the landmarks because um, obesity, um, age has changed where things are. Uh, ladies that are pregnant, it's harder to find the landmarks. On children, it's not. Children, because they're so young, the landmarks, they're so close and they're right there. The big thing, the big thing that you have to remember with CPR or choking, if you feel your rib cage, the, the V that it comes to, right here, there's a little bone at the bottom, the very bottom. It's called the xiphoid process. It's a little piece of bone that sticks out. You should never be down that low to do anything. That piece of bone can break off and that can cause some problems. And if you're down that low, you're too low. You're not doing compressions on the heart and you're not helping a choking victim either. You're actually at the stomach, you're not up where the obstruction is. The other place you don't need to be is too far up. If you're actually on the neck or um, near the collarbones, you're too high up and you can actually damage the trachea. So you need to be right in the center of the chest. And on children, it's much easier to find because all of those landmarks are still where they, where they were when they were born. As we age, things move, but um, it's not People get very upset about, well, is my placement right? It's not, it's, it's not as precise as, um, you don't have to worry about the precision as much as just dead center in the middle of the chest. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Maybe? Okay. Yes, The little bone, if you, if you do the placement with your hand, if you're fist and you roll up, you will actually be under that xiphoid. Now there are, there's always people that are very short-waisted or things like that. If you, if you find the belly button and roll up, you're not going to hit the xiphoid. You're going to be, actually be under it. Other questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure I'm clear about what you said about the 100 to 120 compressions, but about letting the air in. Or out. Okay. Um, All right. No. The 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 blood flow about the compressions. What we're doing when you do a compression, you want to compress that heart. So you're basically flattening out the heart. You want to. You don't want to take your hands off the chest, but you want to allow the chest to recoil enough to for the heart to fill with blood. So we are pushing the blood in and out because these babies have less than the four minutes of oxygen than we do in our blood. 
So what little oxygen is in their blood, we want to circulate it. Now in the certification class, um, they talk about giving breaths for infants, which is very, very important if you have a prolonged CPR because they have so little oxygen. However, that's a, that's a whole a whole another rabbit we need to chase down that hole, and that's a much longer class. But if you just do the hands only with the infant um, and have called 911, you shouldn't be doing it long, especially here in the city of Franklin, in the city of Brentwood, in the city of Fairview. Um, the response times are much shorter because the fire departments are right there in the city. Like I said, out in the county, about six minutes is what we're looking at. But um, I, six minutes is a long time in this situation. It feels more like 60. But know that if you've called 911, there's not going to be a delay. So um, I've always wondered, like, if I'm by myself at home, mm -hmm. which I am a lot, you know, this happens. Right. Like, what, okay, so the, they're choking. When Do I immediately call 911 and then start? Or do I do all of this and then call 911? Or that's a, that's a, that's a, a twofold answer. So if you're home by yourself, because we all have cell phones and they're wonderful, even though they rule our lives sometimes, call 911, lay the phone down, and do this. Okay, so first, immediately yes. before you even grab them, call yes. 911. If you go through, if you go through a certification class for CPR. They will teach you, if, it, if you're doing CPR, you need to do two minutes on infants first and then call 911. However, in this situation, don't delay helping that choking child. Call 911, lay the phone down. Don't give them all your demographics about, yes, I live on this street, and here's the cross street. The child's choking and immediately start to try to remove that obstruction because Unfortunately, um, these these little ones, they don't have a, a lot of time. They don't have a lot of time. They're not going to choke for 20 or 30 minutes before they become unresponsive. Unfortunately, most um, the choking deaths that we see, um, it seems like they, have, they happen in a flash, and they do. Children don't go into cardiac arrest. They're, they're young, they're healthy, unless they have some sort of heart abnormality from birth. We don't see sudden cardiac arrest in infants. They, um, they're healthy, their cholesterol's great, their weight is perfect, they're, they exercise, they don't smoke, they don't drink, they don't eat Burger King every other meal. So they're healthy. Over 90% of the cardiac arrests in kids are from a respiratory problem, choking being one of those respiratory problems. RSV, asthma, choking. Um, so that's why it's very, very important when a child can't breathe, whether it's because they're so stopped up from their allergies or they have RSV or asthma or anything else, that we treat that very aggressively, very early. Same thing with choking. Does that answer your question? No. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because when you press, when you come up, that's when the, they get the air. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And one thing that American Heart Association has realized through their research with hands only, many, many people were not doing CPR because no one wants to put their mouth on someone else. Now with a child, it's a little different. Usually they're our own or a child we know. However, um, the hands only, if you don't want to do the breast or don't feel comfortable or aren't sure how, that's okay. Because with a chest compression, one thing that we found out it does, it pulls air in. A compression is actually creating a vacuum in their, ca in their thoracic cavity, and as you allow that chest recoil, it pulls not a whole lot of air in, not as much as if you have them on an oxygen mask, but it is bringing some air in. We have oxygen in the air around us, and it is bringing some air in. Questions? You mentioned asthma. Uh, I have a grandson that has a bad case of asthma, okay. so sometimes always during the middle of the night, but they've got the what, an inhaler thing. Mm -hmm. But would ever a case come where you would do the chest compressions or some of these other? Only if they become unresponsive. Mm -hmm. If a child goes unresponsive and, and is not breathing, then we would start chest compressions. And that mm -hmm. does happen occasionally with asthmatics. Mm -hmm. 
and I don't say that to scare you at all. No, I know she's don't. taking the class, so she's good. Well Fantastic. Aware, all right, good, good. Other questions? I'm not sure how long this was scheduled to. 7 15. Mm -hmm. I talk fast. I'm sorry. Okay, I have a question. Yes. Um, so my nephew is autistic. Okay. And he gags a lot because he puts too much food in his mouth. Right. So, but my sister, uh, you know, she's never had to do anything right as far as that goes because it always just comes. Yes. So, but how long do you give that? If they before are still she, before she's supposed to start shaking. Right. Um, there is not a okay. You've got another thirty seconds before yeah. I start anything. There's not any kind of time frame like that. Your sister knows her child. If you see a, a child that is gagging, is usually um, it's a partial instruction. <laughs> it may be an almost complete instruction, but chances are they're still able to move. What is whatever is partially choking them. Mm -hmm. Gagging is good. They are gagging trying to get it out. Now, if they're not moving air when they're gagging, if they're if they're making the, the action and there's no air moving, no food is coming out, you need to do a back blow. Okay. Now, I said an infant. Keep in mind there's not there's their their ages are um, recommendations. If you have if you had a, a premature little tiny girl that is never going to be very tall and at 14 or 15 months she's still the size of a, a big 12 month old boy feel free to treat her as an infant even though she's a little older go by size don't go by um, age necessarily so that doesn't really answer your question but there's not a time limit if you see that he's not moving air you need to help him assist him and I know um, he, that he may resist that I don't know how old he is um, he's six okay he may resist that yeah um, and as long as he is able he goes to, as far as turning him a pretty bright shade of red but then it and she's just like come on come yeah. on yeah and, and, and it comes just, out yeah a bright shade of red is okay <laughs> it scares us to death but if there's any kind of duskiness around their mouth um, grayness if they're ever turning any shade of blue it's 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 way past time way past time to have an intervention so if they're coughing like that like you you just let them coughing is good if you're coughing you yeah it's good you don't yeah. you just don't intervene you no. just kind of let them work it now, out the way that I was raised you snatch the child up and you shake them or you oh my gosh <laughs> Okay, we frown upon shaking babies now, so don't do that. Um, I will tell you that my husband is medically trained, and when my son choked, the first thing he did was grab him up and shake him. So all that goes out the window, and it worked. However, um, you you really, if they're coughing, it's just a partial instruction. And you encourage just them to them. cough. Yeah. If they ever stop coughing, it's an issue. That means they've inhaled and it's gone farther or um, their trachea has has stopped trying to move so um, yeah if they're coughing we like coughing we like talking we like crying all those things are good however once they if coughing doesn't work it's time to step in and you know as the kids get older i look for reasons to kind of pat my son on the back okay don't don't look at me like that y'all <laughs> so um, keep in mind, always start with the, the back blows. The chest compressions are a little harder on them. You're not going to do permanent damage, but know that that hurts. That sternum is not supposed to move. It's not supposed to be a bone that goes back and forth. So always start with the back blows. It's much less invasive. And while you're going to do the chest compressions, if you need them, start with the back blows. All right, questions, concerns? You don't do the black back blows though for like toddlers and that, right? Or do you? It depends on their size. Okay. If if it if you have a toddler that is that it, my husband is much stronger than I am. His forearms are much stronger. So if you have a toddler that you can flip over and do that, great. Most toddlers are going to be too big to do that. 
Um, so like if you, children are too big, you should, you should absolutely, try to do that first. Absolutely. Even if they're older, even if yeah. they're... Yeah, I have actually seen people, you know, the two or three year old, if they're able to do it, absolutely. If there's, there's not a hard and fast rule, and it looks a little funnier when the kid's legs are up at the parent's shoulders, but it works. And it's also much more effective when they're panicking because they're choking and they're trying to pull away from you and you're just following them. So if you can do that, absolutely. Absolutely do that. Well, I have just, I have, I work in the preschool downstairs. Uh -huh. And one of the little girls in my class, she's preemie and she's three, but she looks like she's about eight. You know, yeah. She's tiny. Yeah. And she, will still choke a lot as she's eating less. And so one time I just kind of got her out of her chair and just kind of threw her against my leg, just her chest right there. And that really just kind of worked, just keeping her right there right. as far as like, and then the back blows. Yeah, and back blows are fine. Back blows, even if, if they're too big to do that, if you can stand them up, it just doesn't usually work as well. We all grew up doing it. I mean, my mother hit me on the back. You do whatever works. You could even just kind of drape them over yeah. the arm. Yeah, and it's not going to be wrong. If you fold them over the waist and do that, that's fine too. There's not a wrong way as long as that obstruction comes out. Okay. Anything else? Okay. Thank you all very much.